Uh, this evening's talk is by Bari, uh, G8AGN, uh, and um, before retirement, Bari was a professor of, of electromagnetic engineering at the University of Sheffield and head of the antennas research group. His research in interests included microwave antennas and propagation, uh, free uh, space microwave measurements and smart uh, microwave materials and structures. Uh, for his pioneering contributions to the latter field, he was elected as a fellow of the IEEE. Uh, Barry was first licensed in 1965 and made his first microwave contact in 1968 on the 3.4 gigahertz band. Since then, he has worked on all uh, micro bands from 1.3 gigahertz to 134 gigahertz, as well as on the UV, visible and IR nanowave bands. Most of his operation has been done stroke portable. Over the years, Barry has served as a member of the RSGB Microwave and Propagation Studies Committee and the UK micro and also on the UK Microwave Group Committee. He has written a number of articles for RADCOM and is a frequent contributor to Scatterpoint. In his talk this evening, Murray will discuss propagation at 1 to 2 gigahertz and his experiences with using the VK3 CV transceiver board. So over to you then, Barry. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the, uh, the talk. Um, as Neil has said, I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, the VK3 CV transceiver board and also some aspects of uh, propagation at uh, 122 gigahertz. So the talk naturally falls then into two separate parts. So in the first part, I'm going to talk about the transceiver board itself, um, what it is, um, how it works, uh, getting it operational and what you can do with it. And then in the second part, I'm going to discuss propagation at 122 gigahertz because um, the, the way that the waves propagate on 22 gigs is going to be the main factor which will limit how far you can communicate with these uh, BK3 CB boards. So um, all good stories start in a particular way, as, as Star Wars fans will know. Um, of course, here I'm not referring to a galaxy far, far away, but uh, to uh, a country far, far away, at least from the UK. Uh, namely Australia. And the story really starts um, in uh, the autumn of 2019 uh, when Dubis uh, published a very interesting article by Andrew uh, VK3CV, which described um, essentially a groundbreaking design uh, for a 122 gigahertz uh, transceiver. Uh, now, previously, to get on millimeter wave bands was difficult because uh, of uh, the cost of components or the difficulty of actually putting them together. But the beauty about Andrew's design is that most of the RF stuff is actually done in a single chip, which is this one here on the board. It's a chip only four millimeters square, and this is essentially a complete transceiver um, at 122 gigahertz. And then there were a few other bits around on the board um, to actually uh, make it work. So here actually in my hand, which you probably see, it is actually a board. This one is no components, but it gives you an idea of the size of the board. So let's have a look at uh, what goes on inside this um, chip, the one that does all the work. So the, the inside of the chip is, is everything inside this uh, dotted box here. And uh, the, the heart of the chip um, is um, a VCO, which um, works at a frequency of about 60 gigahertz. A fraction of that output from the chip is divided down by a factor of 32. And this then goes outside the board into uh, a phase lock loop chip, which is working at a frequency of around 1.9 gigahertz. So everything above 1.9 gigahertz 
uh, is happening in this one little chip. And frequencies below uh, 1.9 are actually on the, the, the small board um, itself. So the uh, phase lock loop chip um, generates its own 1.9 gigahertz signal, and we're comparing um, that signal with the sample signal we're obtaining from the oscillator on the chip. Now, this has to have some external reference, and this is done at 10 megahertz. And uh, this is done with a temperature controlled um, crystal oscillator on, on the, the, um, the board itself. And uh, this is locked up. Um, using a, a one pulse per second from a GPS module. So if we go back to the innards of the, the chip itself, um, we, we now have a, a phase locked uh, VCO here at about 60 gigahertz. We then double this to 120 gigahertz, and then we split the power off, with, and it then goes through two power amplifiers. Now, the unusual thing about this uh, system is that the transmitter is switched on all the time, even when you're receiving. So there's no transmit receive function as such. Anyway, if we look at the, the transmit path, uh, we have a, a power amplifier, and then actually on the chip, there is a small transmit antenna, which is basically just a half wave dipole. If we now come down on the receive side, um, we have a receiving antenna also on the chip, which is um, a half wave dipole. Uh, this then uh, has a low noise amplifier at the back of it. And then we have a pair of mixers, and these are fed <coughs> in phase and quadrature. Um, so we've got a 90 degree phase shifter here. So the output of the chip essentially is at the IF frequency. And we have available, if we want to use them, the in-phase and quadrature components. Although the um, board as it stands, when you first get it, um, only uses one of these two components. The IF itself can be anywhere in the range from more or less DC up to 200 megahertz. But in fact, most people are using two meters as the IF frequency. So if you look at the, the other characteristics of the um, chip itself, the transmit power nominally is about half a milliwatt. In practice, it'll be somewhat less than that by the time we get the RF out into the outside world. Um, but the other nice thing about this chip is that the receiver has a noise signal of 12 dBs, um, and that's the double sideband version. So if we were to use the I and Q components here to achieve uh, sideband suppression, um, we would get the noise figure down to somewhere around about 9 dBs, which is uh, quite a remarkable performance um, for such a system working at such a frequency. Well, let's now have a look at the, the board itself. And uh, what I'm doing now is showing the, the back side of the board. So the, um, the actual chip itself, the radar chip, um, is on the other side of the board and, it, and it's round about here on the board. But um, we have to make quite a few connections to the board to actually get it operational. And um, what I've done here is I, I've used um, Arduino header pins um, to make my connections to the board. Now the um, header pins actually are a square cross section. Um, and they don't actually fit through the board in most places. So if you use header pins of a square cross section, don't be tempted to drill out the holes in the PCB um, to push the pins through, um, because this is a four layer board and you may well uh, cut some of the connections between the various layers on the board. So what I had to do was to actually take a needle file and uh, actually file the corners off each individual pin to make them fit through the board. Um, what else we can see on here? Well, all the various connections. Firstly, we need uh, 12 volt power uh, supply. So this is up here, a positive and negative. Um, one of the uh, 
control switches for the board is something called the channel AB switch. And um, this is, is connected at this point here. And although you can't easily see it, there are three other um, PCB connections on the board here, which on the other side of the board go to a rotary dill switch, which is the, the main channel uh, select switch um, for, the, for the transceiver. Um, there's space here for um, reprogramming the PIC, the, the PIC controller, which controls the operation of the board. And so there's space here for something like a PIC kit programmer to just plug in. I, I mentioned that the um, phase lock loop, the 1.9 gigahertz phase lock loop, um, is locked up with the 10 megahertz signal, which is locked itself uh, to GPS. And so this, this is the input region down here for that GPS module. Uh, we've got um, a couple of header lines up here for the mic input, for your uh, FM speech. And then we've got a couple of other um, inputs here for a press the talk switch and the key switch, which essentially is how you send uh, Morse. Um, you can either have a continuous carrier or you can send actually CW using a Morse key. Um, although uh, most people won't use this, there are also pins here for the receiver IQ outputs. So that, that's available if you want it. Uh, the other thing I should perhaps mention is the fact that um, to ensure that the uh, transmit receive board is operating with the correct polarization, um, there is actually on the board an arrow um, which shows you the direction of propagation, sorry, of wave polarization. So, uh, as this is shown here at the moment, uh, the board is set up to uh, receive and transmit horizontal polarization, which is applicable to the UK. So, if, if you uh, use vertical polarization, then the board has to be turned around through 90 degrees um, to achieve that. Uh, the only other thing which is uh, visible on this photo is um, an RS232 interface at the top. So you can um, interface with the board and, and get error messages and, and um, you can program, for example, uh, a message, a CW message for when the board is in beacon mode. So there's quite a lot of things that are going on here. Right, so let's now just talk a little bit about frequency stability. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, um, the phase lock loop on the board uh, needs the 10 megahertz reference signal. And when the board um, is supplied, um, it makes use of um, a 10 megahertz uh, voltage controlled temperature compensated crystal oscillator. And so this is locked up with uh, a one pulse per second signal from GPS. So when you first switch on the board, uh, you'll find that the uh, frequency on 122 gigahertz um, is, is more or less there instantly. So uh, in terms of long term stability, the average frequency uh, is very uh, good. But what you will notice is that there are noticeable short term fluctuations in frequency. And this is caused by the way that the PIC controller actually uh, makes corrections to the phase lock loop uh, circuitry. And uh, so this is, this is not um, perhaps as good as it might be, um, but it, I guess it's possible that um, the PIC code could be slightly optimized more than it is. Uh, the other uh, thing which will cause some frequency variations uh, will be due to drafts and things like that. So it might be advisable also to put a bit of thermal insulation around that um, that uh, PCO chip. Um, as the system stands, when you receive it, it's very good for FM speech. Uh, not quite so good though for CW because of these short-term fluctuations uh, that I mentioned earlier. So when you receive a signal, you'll find that the signal is wobbling around slightly in frequency. And at times it does make the CW rather hard to, um, to copy. 
what I've done on both my systems is that uh, I've removed this uh, VCXO and uh, I feed in a 10 megahertz signal from an external reference, which in my case is a double oven, um, oven controlled crystal oscillator. And I'm using these particular ones, uh, which came off eBay for about 30 pounds, something like that. Um, of course, these take some time to uh, warm up, typically 10 minutes. But once they have warmed up, um, the, the 10 megahertz signal you get out is extremely stable. Um, the only slight drawback is that you don't know the actual frequency you're on, on 122 gigahertz. Uh, the frequency will be very stable, but you're not quite sure exactly what it is. Um, it, it'll be within a few megahertz. Sorry, yeah, a few megahertz, but um, certainly it's, it's best to calibrate these uh, OCXOs against a standard such as the Rubidium um, standard. Once you've done that, then you know exactly where you are in frequency and you know it's going to be very, very stable. And the thing about using the external uh, OCXO as a reference is that you then get excellent frequency stability. You can hold a signal easily within a 50 hertz bandwidth uh, on the uh, two meter IF, and it will just sit there forever, basically. It doesn't drift at all. So this is excellent for CW. It's excellent for uh, things like SSTV, and it's certainly excellent for digital modes. As, as I will show later on in the talk. Um, the FM uh, using an external OCXO is, is adequate. It's, it's not perfect, but it's not too bad. Um, and certainly, of course, it's good for CW. Now, a lot of people um, have found that um, it's quite difficult to remember um, how to actually set this transceiver board operate in a particular mode um, because you have a number of switches which are down here you've got three switches down here which determine the the mode of operation whether you're on receive or transmit whether you're transmitting cw or whether you're transmitting fm speech and so on and you also have a, a rotary uh, diddle switch which you can't actually see at the moment in this view it's tucked away on the front side of the board and that's the main channel switch so you've actually got quite a few uh, lines of control um, which go to the the um, transceiver board and and uh, these all have to be in the right combinations um, to get the to get a particular mode of operation for the board so I got fed up with doing this, and, and in the end, what I did was that I designed a, a status display board, which is shown in this picture here. And um, essentially what it does is it uses an Arduino, um, a Pro Mini, because it, um, it works in 3.3 volts, which is compatible with the transceiver board. So the Pro Mini actually monitors uh, the state of the various control lines uh, which go to the uh, transceiver board. And then it uses a lookup table basically to decide what mode of operation the transceiver board is in. So in the case here, um, we can see at the moment that it's set up to receive, and that's shown in green. Um, we're actually operating on channel six, um, which is in fact 124 uh, gigahertz as shown here and we're on receive so it tells us what the receive local oscillator frequency is and it also tells us what the IF frequency is and uh, these will change as as you operate these very switches um, to change the mode of operation because the original board required uh, a GPS module um, We've got some NEMA data available as well from it, as well as the one pulse per second. So, uh, yes, the one pulse per second. Um, so I thought I'd use the NEMA data as well um, to actually work out the, the 10 figure um, locator and also the time, which is shown on the display as well. This is um, 
a circuit schematic for the way the display works. So we've got the uh, BK3 transceiver board here, and then we've got uh, six uh, lines, control lines, and these are monitored by six pins on the Arduino. And um, we've also got um, a signal coming in from the GPS module on one of the other Arduino pins. And then we can show what's going on on uh, a little TFT display. Uh, on my system, I, the Pro Mini I'm using, it seems to have quite a hefty 3.3 uh, volt regulator. And so I'm actually running all this lot um, from the 3.3 the volt supply, which is provided by the Pro Mini. Um, other people have found that the Pro Minis they've got have a much um, smaller 3.3 volt regulator on board and so they've preferred to uh, run all this from an external 3.3 volt regulator with uh, a, a bigger current capability so um, that's probably a better way of doing it now i mentioned earlier that the the transceiver board itself has the ability to um, use uh, both I and Q channels um, which are coming out at the IF frequency. Uh, these are not used on the on the standard board but Andrew BK3CB um, has actually um, designed um, an extra piece of circuitry which will plug into the transceiver board uh, so that you can uh, get uh, unwanted sideband uh, suppression. So un unwanted sideband suppression. So uh, this has the effect that uh, you improve the um, receiver noise figure by about three dBs, which is worth having. Now this is a board which uh, Merrick SP um, for ELF has designed, and um, he published the um, artwork and the Gerber files for this board. Um, it uses uh, 0603 components again, so very small, quite difficult to solder up. But this shows a board, uh, and these are his pictures in fact, um, it shows a board uh, populated and it's so arranged that it will plug in by this header. It will plug directly into the uh, pins, the IQ pins on the transceiver board. And it also has two mounting holes which are the same uh, pitch spacing as two of the holes on the transceiver board. So you can literally plug it into the board uh, and then take out your um, uh, selected sideband from the receiver, either, either the upper or the lower sideband, whichever one you prefer. Right, so that's the transceiver board as such. Um, let's now talk a little bit about antennas. Um, when you buy the uh, transceiver board, and, and for this we must thank Tim, uh, VK2XAX, who is the man who's been responsible for actually getting these boards into production through uh, a crowdfunding uh, scheme. And I think we have a lot to thank him for, uh, for, for putting this enormous amount of effort into ensuring that quite a few of these boards are now available to people. Anyway, when you buy the, the transceiver boards, um, you can also buy at the same time um, a 21 dB horn and a chaparral dish feed. Now I mentioned that the, the uh, radar chip itself, it's only four millimeters square, uh, but it does have two half wave dipoles, uh, one for transmit, one for receive, but actually on the board. But you need to add a couple of the energy that these radiate um, into something like a dish feed or horn, in other words, to the outside world. And the way this is done is by a, a sort of transducer which fits over the top of the radar chip itself. And the transducer looks basically a bit like a thimble, it's about that size, and it just has a hole at one end. And you then um, can bolt on your horn or your dish feed um, to that point. And this is how you uh, you communicate with the outside world, as it were. Um, if, if you 
uh, have a, a dish with a different f over d for which this dish feed is not really applicable, um, then uh, Neil G4 DBN, um, if you ask him nicely, uh, will make custom made horns for uh, a specified dish f over d. He has made quite a few now, um, but obviously he's quite snow, snowed under with orders. So if you order one, don't expect it tomorrow. But when it does come, it will be very nicely made. Uh, if we think a little bit more about dish antennas, um, well, you can use surplus dishes if you're lucky to have them. So things like the Murad, which was around quite some time ago, uh, Paso Link um, type antennas, the cast grains. But I think most people will have to make do with satellite TV antennas. Um, quite a good one if you can find them is an XB Sky B dish, which which is a, a slightly squarer version of it of a of a, a round dish is the best way to describe it. Um, those are quite good, and I'll show you an example of using that in a minute. Um, but another source of supply um, is a company called Edmund Scientific, which is actually an American supplier of optical equipment um, but they do have um, a uk subsidiary which i think is based in york and uh, one of the, the items they do stock are, are um, reflectors um, which i suppose are really meant for optics but so they're, they're just spun metal um, parabolic reflectors basically and a number of people have used these uh, at 122 gigahertz quite successfully and finally, the only other sort of antenna at the moment, which certainly I've looked at, um, is, is a lens antenna. And uh, I was lucky enough to have um, quite a large lens antenna, uh, a 150 millimeter diameter lens, plastic lens, which came out of a, a Philips um, 49 gigahertz system, which was originally intended for uh, microwave video distribution. And in fact, as I'll show in a minute, this lens does seem to work quite well. Um, you can get also uh, Fresnel page magnifiers from various sources. Um, and at first sight, you might think you could use one of those. I mean, these are Fresnel lenses, but they're very flat profile. Um, but they're not effective at this frequency because the, the ridges uh, on, on the piece of plastic sheet which actually forms the lens. Uh, are not uh, of the right dimensions to work at, um, at 122 gigahertz, so they're not worth trying. Right, well, let's have a look at um, one or two practical examples of dishes. Um, I mentioned the B Sky B dish. Um, I, I did spend a bit of time when I first built up my boards um, trying to feed a dish and uh, was remarkably unsuccessful because the adjustment is very, very critical. Um, and so in the end, uh, what I ended up with was uh, taking a B-Sky B dish and putting it on its side and um, mounting it essentially on a pedestal so it sticks up above the baseboard. And then um, my rig is seen here, it's in a plastic box. And this is also mounted on a pedestal such that the feed, in this case the chaparral feed, is at exactly the right height um, to feed the centre of the dish. Now, I was lucky enough uh, with this dish that I had the feed support arm and also the uh, LMB clamp, although I didn't have the original LMB. And so, um, in the true spirit of amateur radio, um, I found a piece of room handle of the right diameter and was able to slide this along until it actually touched the dish and that then told me um, where the uh, original um, feed on the LMB would have would have been looking at uh, on the surface of the dish and I was then able to uh, work out exactly how I should set up my my feed here um, by that I mean the height above above the, the baseboard and also where it should look in terms of the geometry, so up here somewhere. And then uh, the other thing I needed to do was to get the focus right. And so what I've done here is just put a couple of wooden runners on the baseboard so I can move the whole 
uh, rig and the feed backwards and forwards until I get the right focal point. And this is really critical because um, if you're out by something like a millimeter or less, you can find that your signal, received signal, for example, will vary by anything up to 10 dBs. So focusing of, of the dish at these frequencies is extremely um, exacting, to put it mildly. Um, this is a second sort of dish. Um, this one is by G4APV, Bob, a, a local amateur to me. And this is a, a relay dish. And I think quite a lot of these have appeared at rallies and so on, round tables over the years. It's a standard dish, um, but it's meant for use on different frequency bands. And the way that you do this is that you take out uh, one feed and replace it with another one. The feed itself is basically a piece of circular waveguide, and then it has a little reflector on the end and uh, a dielectric button just to shape the uh, radiation pattern of the feed to illuminate the dish. Um, these dishes normally come with a radome on the front, but uh, this has been taken off to, uh, to um, uh, cut down the attenuation because I'm not quite sure what the losses in that radome would be at these frequencies. In this close-up, you can see the way that Bob has mounted his board. Here's the chaparral feed, for example, here. Um, and then he's got various um, adjustments so he can move the, the board and the feed in and out, and then he can move it up and down and side to side. And then his control uh, circuitry, the switches and so on, are contained in a separate box at the top here. And that seems to work quite well in practice. I, I mentioned the um, lens uh, antenna, and, and this is how I set mine up. Uh, the lens is a plano convex lens, so it's flat on the front and then uh, curved on the side, which actually faces the feed. Um, and it's mounted actually on, on a piece of plastic pipe, which is really meant for uh, extractor fan use. So you, you can buy this off the internet, it's exactly the right size uh, that you can just um, stick a lens on the front with a bit of uh, hot glue. The uh, focusing is achieved here uh, by moving my uh, rig and the feed backwards and forwards on some slides which uh, are made out of electrical trunking. So uh, the trunking is like a U-shaped piece of plastic and then there's a top and that slides along quite nicely. Um, but once you stop sliding, then it, it grips the top to the base and, and holds it quite securely. And that works extremely well. I've used this both at, at, at these sort of frequencies and also uh, uh, on the optical bands. Right, so that's the board itself. Uh, so next question is, what can you do with it? Well, uh, as the board comes, it has what I, I might term uh, three standard modes of operation. Uh, the first thing I should say is, or, or reiterate, is the fact that the, the chip, the, the 122 gigahertz chip, um, doesn't uh, go between transmit and receive in the conventional sense, uh, because the uh, RF is always there, both on the transmit and the receive uh, antennas. And um, the way that you have to transmit CW then, for example, is by using frequency shift keying. So um, the board actually operates on a different frequency depending on whether uh, you've got key down, whether you've got key up. And uh, usually that, that uh, frequency separation is the IF frequency, um, typically 144 megahertz. So it is a true FSK system. So every time you put the key down, then the um, the 60 gigahertz um, VCO on the chip ha has to change its frequency. And it can do this very quickly, so you don't notice that. And um, a similar sort of thing is done um, at uh, for FM suite, at speech. Um, and the way that you do this by altering the uh, frequency of the 10 megahertz reference for the phase lock loop. And then there's a, a third um, 
mode of operation which is modulated CW. So you have a, essentially an FM uh, tone which is being transmitted and then you key it on and off. So those are the standard modes, um, but I was quite interested to see what other modes could be uh, um, done with this board. And so we have here a number of other modes which I have tried out in practice with the VK3 board. Um, I, so I've, I've transmitted Hellschreiber, uh, I've transmitted SSTV, and I've also transmitted digital modes such as JT4 and JT65. Um, it may be possible to do other modes. Um, I think to some extent you have to um, suck it and see and see what happens. But the first one I tried was Hellschreiber because essentially that is an on-off mode. So that, that is equivalent to um, doing FSKCW in, in effect. So uh, the way that I did this was um, I had a, a PS2 uh, keyboard, an old PS2 keyboard. And in fact, you can still buy these on eBay for only a few pounds. But the beauty of these keyboards is that they're very easy to interface with an Arduino, uh, simply because there is a library um, available which you can put in an, in an Arduino sketch uh, to enable you to communicate with, with one of these keyboards. And so it was very simple uh, to then um, essentially type in a message on, on the keyboard and then um, get the nano to essentially uh, key uh, the VK3 board. So it, as far as the VK3 board is concerned, you plug it into the keyjack and um, it, it's sending CW. But in this case, it's actually Hellschreiber. So uh, th this was a, a, a nice little project, which seems to work quite well in practice. So um, here's the result of, of transmitting some Hellschreiber um, across a 122 gigahertz link. Uh, this was over two kilometers. Um, it will go much further than that, but uh, this just happened to be a test, which I did on the day with, again, with Bob G4APV. And uh, this was done on the 13th of September last year. And uh, we were able to um, have a full health fiber um, QSO. Um, on the right hand side, um, this is a, a oh, I should say that this, this was received use, or displayed using the IZ8 BLY software. Um, on the right hand side here, we can see a standalone health fiber uh, reader, which again is based on an Arduino and then just a little TFT screen. And this again is showing a signal uh, which has been passed over 122 gigahertz. Now, if we want to um, transmit uh, other modes such as SSTV and the JT modes, um, we have to use the VK3 transceiver board in a slightly different way. And um, to explain this, I have to go back to first principles. So just bear with me for a moment. Um, if you think of an AM signal, if you think of the spectrum for such a signal, then uh, if we imagine that this is the carrier, so this is a frequency spectrum we're showing here. So if we imagine that this is an AM carrier, then when we apply modulation to that uh, carrier, uh, what we do is that the modulation power actually goes to form sidebands. So if we were uh, modulating with a single audio tone, for example, uh, we would see the carrier and then we would see the sidebands which are spaced away from the carrier by the, the modulation frequency. As we increase the modulation, then uh, the carrier amplitude remains constant and any power that comes into the system goes into making these sidebands uh, bigger. So, um, for an AM system, then the amount of transmitted power varies according to the, the amount of modulation you apply to the transmission. Now, uh, the VK3 uh, board uh, uses FM modulation, not AM. And so it works in a slightly different way. And the important thing to remember is that with an FM signal, the total of transmitted power is, is constant. 
irrespective of the modulation that you apply. So in, in this case, if, if we only have a small amount of modulation applied to an FM carrier, then we would get a spectrum which looks like this. As we increase the amount of modulation, what, ha what happens is that because the total power being transmitted is constant, the sideband power can only uh, exist because it's robbed power from the carrier. So the carrier amplitude drops the more sidebands that we get in the FM spectrum. And if we get this right, then eventually we'll get to a situation like this at the bottom here, where the amount of power in the carrier was very, very small, and most of the power being transmitted is in the sidebands. And there's one particular value of modulation where it's the first pair of sidebands which uh, dominate over the spectrum. And the spectrum now looks very much like a standard AM signal, uh, but with a, a greatly reduced carrier. And what we now want to do is to modulate the signal uh, such that uh, these pair of sidebands here um, effectively move up and down um, with the modulation that we're applying. And if we can do that, as I say, it, it, it now mimics an amplitude reduced carrier signal. So this is what we use for SSTB and, and the JT modes. So here's an example of uh, sending SSTV with a VK3 CB board. Uh, what we're doing is we're um, reducing an SSTV signal using uh, MMSSTV software and the audio uh, signal which the software produces is just fed into the microphone uh, socket on the VK3 board. And then uh, for receive, um, we simply take the audio from the uh, remote receiver and just feed it back into the software so we can display the received signal. So this is the signal of the, of the image as transmitted over 122 gigahertz. And this was the signal as received. And we can see it's quite a, a nice um, quality signal uh, or picture rather. There's a little bit of wobble on the edge here, but I think this is due mainly to uh, the difference in the clock frequencies um, between the two sound cards in the two computers. Um, so it, it does show that you can do SSTV. If we now look at WSJT modes, uh, we use the same principle um, that we uh, produce the WSJT mode using the standard software, Joe Taylor's software, and we feed the audio signal um, into the uh, mic uh, socket on the BK3 board. And then um, we take the output from the receiver, the remote receiver, and we feed that back into the um, WSJT um, software. And what I'm showing here um, essentially is the stability of the system that I have, bearing in mind that the transmitter and the receiver. So I've got two transceiver boards, one being used as a transmitter, the other as the receiver. Um, but they're both fitted with 10 megahertz double oven dose EXOs as the frequency references um, for the radar chip phase lock loop. So um, if we take, for example, um, what we've got up here, um, we're getting a decode here, for example, of a JT4A signal. And if we think of a JT4A signal, uh, it's four tones, four audio tones, but the spacing is only 4.4 hertz. So the total receiver bandwidth is 18 hertz. And uh, my system is easily able to uh, be stable enough to cope with that narrowband signal um, because my system doesn't drift. Um, then um, it can easily cope with that sort of bandwidth of the signal. And then I've, I've looked again uh, using JT65A, which is the mode which has uh, got the narrowest tone spacing. So each tone spacing is 2.7 hertz, giving a total signal bandwidth of 178 hertz. And again, um, this was easily able to be decoded. So that, that's, that's quite a remarkable tribute to the stability of these systems 
uh, providing that you uh, use external um, 10 megahertz references. I, I would point out that you can't do this with the VK3 board with the onboard um, 10 megahertz uh, VCO. You, you don't have this frequency stability to do it. Right, so that's that's the first half of the talk, talking about the board itself. But I, I now want to spend a few minutes, probably 15, 20 minutes, talking about propagation at 122 gigahertz, because really this will be the main factor uh, in determining how far you can actually communicate with the transceiver boards. So let, let's just um, go through a few basic points here. Um, if, if the Earth didn't have an atmosphere, then um, the signals which are transmitted from a, a transmitter, um, when, when you come to receive them, um, you find that uh, every time you double the distance between the transmitter and the receiver, uh, the path loss um, goes up by 6 dBs. And that's just the consequence of the inverse square law that the signal from the transmitter has to spread out uh, if you like, and cover a, a larger area of space. Of course, we do have a, an atmosphere around the Earth, and so we do have gases such as oxygen and nitrogen, but more importantly, uh, we do also have water vapour, uh, which, which, if you like, is a gas um, within the atmosphere. And so what we really want to know is what additional path loss uh, the presence of the oxygen and the water vapour along the path between the transmitter and the receiver um, will actually add to our um, original path loss. Now, um, clever people have looked at this in the past and the ITU, the uh, International Telecommunications Union, has actually published a very interesting uh, report which considers this very question. And they've come up with a mathematical model to enable you to calculate uh, what sort of extra losses you're likely to get um, on any given day um, due to the atmosphere. Well, I don't propose to look at any maths in this talk, obviously, but I, I want to use this model and, and, and come to some conclusions about propagation and how it will affect how we get on with our, our rigs. Uh, here is um, a graph from that report, and what it's showing is the attenuation due to the atmosphere uh, along the path between the transmitter and the receiver as a function of frequency. And this graph has been calculated for uh, a particular set of atmospheric conditions. Uh, these, are, these are often referred to as standard atmospheric conditions. But So we have an atmospheric pressure, a barometric pressure of just over a thousand millibars, which is sort of fairly typical for the atmosphere. Um, they've taken a temperature of 15 degrees centigrade and they've given a value for how much water is contained within the atmosphere in the form of vapour. And what we see uh, as we go along this axis here is that, for example, at 10 gigahertz, the amount of attenuation due to the presence of oxygen and water vapour in the atmosphere is very, very small. It's typically less than, well, maybe... A, a hundredth of a, a dB per kilometre. So over a hundred kilometre path, the atmosphere will add just one dB of loss. Um, unfortunately, though, we're up here. Um, so if we come up to this point here, for example, this is 60 gigahertz. And um, we see there's an enormous uh, absorption peak in the atmosphere at this point. And the attenuation there is is somewhere between 10 and 20 dBs per kilometre. Now that's purely due to um, absorption by oxygen. Well, luckily we're not at that point in our operations. We're up here somewhere at 122 gigahertz. Now this is a logarithmic scale, so it's difficult to see here exactly where 122 gigahertz actually lies. But we do see on the graph here an ominous peak, an absorption peak. And this is due mainly to um, absorption in the atmosphere due to oxygen. So there are molecular resonances, and, and when these occur, you, you get increased absorption. 
And uh, if we look at the numbers involved here at 118 gigahertz, which is where this particular oxygen absorption peak occurs, we see that uh, the atmosphere is adding to the order of 1.3 dBs per kilometer. So if, if you're running over, uh, transmitting over a 10 kilometer path, that means that you get an additional path loss of 13 dBs on top of your normal path loss. And this value um, is, is only a typical value. It could be a lot worse than that. It could be somewhat better. And it depends on the actual conditions in the atmosphere over the path that you're trying to work. Well, we need to try and get a handle on uh, how big our loss actually is, how far down this edge of the, of the curve actually are we when we're at 122 gigahertz. And, and if we know that, we can then assess really uh, how important the atmosphere loss is uh, in limiting our ability to work over a given path. So let, let's just remind ourselves of a few uh, facts really first. Um, the, the 122 gig band extends from 122 to 50 to 123 dead. Uh, the oxygen absorption is at 118.75. Um, the ITU model that we're going to use can be used to estimate the atmospheric losses at anywhere between 1 and 100 gigahertz. Um, so that, that's well within you know, where we want to be. So let's try and use this model um, or the results from the model to see how we get on at 122 gigahertz. Well, to use the model, uh, we need some input data. And the first of the uh, pieces of data we need is what frequency are we actually using? Uh, because the model is, is valid over a wide range, but we need to say exactly what frequency we're using because we've seen that the loss does vary quite widely with different frequencies. The next thing we, to know, we need to know is the barometric pressure, the air pressure. And uh, we need to know, um, if, or we need to understand that this barometric pressure that you, you measure with a barometer, for example, actually has two components. There's the air pressure, which is due to the dry air. And so that's mainly because of the oxygen and the nitrogen in the atmosphere. Uh, but there's also some uh, additional air pressure, which is due to the presence of the water vapor. And we need to know what these two partial pressures are separately uh, to put into our model. Uh, we also need to know the temperature of the atmosphere. Now, we normally measure this in, in degrees centigrade, but we actually need it in Kelvin, but there's an easy conversion from one to the other. We also need to know how much water vapor is held in the air. And um, we have to do this usually by measuring something called the relative humidity. Once we know that, we can then uh, use that number to calculate the partial pressure of the water vapor in the air. And then the other data we need in the model um, is information about where the uh, absorption resonances for oxygen and water vapor occur. In other words, at what frequencies? Now, there are quite a lot of these resonances within this range covered by the model. And this means that we have an awful lot of data values uh, that we need to put into the model. So it's quite complex. So let's just look at a, a few of these variables. Um, we, we need to know the uh, atmospheric pressure and we need to know it um, at the operating point. If we are at portable, for example, we need to know when we're standing on a hill or wherever, we need to know what the atmospheric pressure is, where you are, and preferably also at the other end of the link. Now, if you look at the standard Met charts, the Met Office charts, where they give you the forecast for pressure, uh, these pressures are pressures at sea level. They're not pressures at uh, the height at which you might be. So if you're standing on a hill several hundred meters above sea level, then the atmospheric pressure where you are is not going to be the same as the forecasted pressures here. So that's, you know, that's one problem we have. And uh, to give you an idea of how important that height variation between sea level and where you actually are is, 
uh, I've got a, an approximate graph here, which shows um, if we assume, for example, that the uh, air pressure at sea level is say a thousand millibars, as you increase the height of your station, then we see that the pressure drops off. So for example, at my QTH, I'm about 280 uh, meters above sea level. Um, lucky me, but I'm surrounded by trees and things, so not such a good sight after all. But uh, you can see then that uh, if the uh, air pressure at sea level is 1,000 millibars, where I, am, where I am is going to be down at about 960 something. And in fact, uh, at my location, the air pressure never really rises uh, above 1,000 millibars, even at the height of summer, simply because of this difference in height. So we need to be able to measure air pressure where we actually are. Well, how are we going to do this, bearing in mind that it would be nice to have this in real time and it's got to be at where we are. And also we'd like to be able to, as well as measuring pressure, we'd like to be able to measure the temperature of the air and the water content. Well, luckily there is a, a sensor which uh, we can use. Um, it's only a very small chip, it's about two and a half millimeters square and it will measure in real time the atmospheric pressure, the temperature and the relative humidity. And the output from this is an electrical format. And even more luckily, um, there was a library, an Arduino library, which some kind person has written, which means that you can actually use an Arduino to read off the data values in real time, which makes life very easy. So this leads on to uh, real time, um, if you like, calculation of what's going on at your location. Now, ideally, uh, one of these um, things called weather box, uh, and I've just got one here, you can just about see in my hand. Um, ideally, you would like one of these at each end of the link that you're trying to establish, the path that you're trying to work. But essentially, in this box, um, there was an Arduino Mega 2560, um, so it's a standalone box, battery powered. Um, we have to use uh, an Arduino 2560 because the sketch that runs in Weatherbox is about 1700 lines long, so it's, it's quite a long piece of code. But with Weatherbox, you can firstly um, get real time measurement of your location and the date and time. And this is because Weatherbox has a GPS module in it. Um, it has real time measurements of the atmospheric pressure, temperature, and relative humidity. And these can then be fed in um, to the uh, ITU propagation model. And uh, the, the Arduino will actually do the calculations for you. And it will uh, give you certain information from that, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, you can also feed into this box um, information about the radio systems that you're using. So, for example, um, obviously the frequency that you're using, um, your transmit power, the gains of the antennas at each end of the link, um, the noise performance of the receiver and uh, the receiver bandwidth. And um, what it will then calculate um, is an estimate of what your received signal uh, should be, um, which is quite useful because this is a real time indication of what's going on. Um, the weather box also has an SD card here, so it can data log not only the weather data, but um, how um, or what sort of values you might be predicting for your uh, signal level at the receiver. And so you can then compare this with what you actually measure. And then it also has things like a help screen that tell you how all the various things work in this. Well, here's a schematic of the weather box. Um, the Arduino Mega, obviously. GPS input for location and date time. A keypad for data input, um, like um, the parameters for your radio system and the frequency. Here's input from the weather sensor. And then we stuff output to a screen and also we can put output to an SD card. 
And here are some uh, typical screenshots showing you what's going on. Um, so here we've got a help screen which says, well, if you want to put data in about your radio system, just press the button D on the keypad. Um, if you want to log data, uh, then you can switch it on and off with uh, key C. And this will then ask you how often you want to log data. Is it once a second, once a minute, once an hour, whatever. We've got 10 memories here for saving data about the system, for example. And uh, this data is saved on power off. So you've got it when, it, when you put the power back on. Um, here's a way that we actually enter data about the radio system itself. So you can enter the frequency in gigahertz, uh, the path loss in kilometers, transmit power in milliwatts, uh, the transmit antenna gain in dBs, receive antenna gain dBs, noise figure in dBs, and the receiver bandwidth in kilohertz. And then uh, once you've got that information, it then goes into the calculation mode. And here is a screenshot of, of real time data coming out from weather box. So here we've got uh, the location of the weather box. So that's where your station is. So it's a, a 10 figure uh, main head locator. This is the frequency we're working on 122850. Um, this was the date. So this is the 13th of January 2020. This was the time. Uh, this was the path length, 25 kilometers. This is only an example, I haven't worked that distance. Um, but this is real measured data here. This is weather data. This is the relative humidity of the atmosphere. So it's 40% humid. Um, this is the atmospheric pressure, 957 millibars. And this was the um, temperature, 20.6 degrees Celsius. And then, it then works out the water content uh, in the atmosphere. And in this case, it's 7.2 grams of water per cubic meter of atmosphere. So uh, it's a surprising amount, really. Um, considering that the temperature is quite high, you might think that the, the amount of water is low. That's not necessarily the case. Um, this shows you the total additional path loss uh, due to the presence of the oxygen and the water vapor in the atmosphere. So this is the extra path loss, which you have to add on to the, the normal uh, path loss, um, which is just governed by the path length and the frequency. And then this gives you an estimate of the received carrier to noise ratio in dBs. So these values will obviously change, um, you know, every few seconds um, when, when we get a new, a new set of data coming in. Well, let's see. Um, a few results from the, the ITU model. Uh, and again, we'll just stick with the standard um, atmospheric um, conditions. Uh, but I, as I say, I will point out that your conditions on the day may vary considerably from these. But these are just for purposes of illustration. So if you look at the oxygen absorption resonance frequency of 118 gigahertz, then the loss due to water vapor is about 0.6 of a dB per kilometer. The oxygen loss is 1.3 dBs per kilometer. So obviously, at this at this frequency, it's the oxygen loss which dominates the path loss. Well, the extra path loss. And so the total extra path loss is of the order of 2 dBs per kilometer. If we go up into our band of frequencies, so if we go at the bottom end of the band at 122.25, we see the water loss is not much different. It's increased very slightly, but not very much. But the uh, fortuitous result we get for the oxygen loss that's dropped from 1.3 dBs per kilometer down to only 0.7 of a dB. So our total uh, loss due to the atmosphere now then is halved roughly from where we were at the oxygen absorption point. So it's, it's slightly less than one dB per kilometer now. And if we work at the top end of the band at 123 gigahertz, um, the water loss has increased again very slightly, but the oxygen loss has dropped a bit more. And so this, this is an indication of our total 
extra path loss due to the atmosphere. Now we can see that actually it, it is advantageous if you're, if you're interested in working long distances um, to work at the top end of the band because although these numbers may not appear to be very different, if you were trying to work say a hundred kilometer path, then uh, going from the bottom end of the band to the top end of the band would save you, at least with this set of input data, uh, uh, about 6 dBs of loss, which is well worth having. So the, the um, conclusion we draw from this is that when we're um, operating at 122 gigahertz, it's not the oxygen absorption which we have to worry about, but it's the absorption due to the water content. And, and this, I think, is probably the most important point to come out of this discussion. Well, I'm getting to the end now of the talk, but I, I thought I would just pop in a couple of slides talking about the challenge of working DX on 122 gigahertz. And what I've done here um, is take an example where, let's suppose that we've worked uh, a, a five kilometer path and we've received very strong signals over that five kilometer path uh, when we're working at 122 gigahertz. And we then decide um, that we're going to go for a longer path length. So let's double the path length to 10 kilometers, say. Well, the free space path loss, in other words, if there were no atmosphere at all, then we'd expect that the additional path loss would be 6 dBs. And this is shown uh, by the blue curve here, which has gone up by 6 dBs. But because we do have um, the presence of oxygen and water vapor in the atmosphere, these add additional path loss. And we're assuming here that this extra path loss, the gas loss, is 1 dB per kilometer. So we've got an extra 5 dBs of loss due to the gas loss, the oxygen and the water vapor, which has to be stacked on top of our 6 dBs due to the free space path loss. So in going from 5 kilometers to 10 kilometers path length, we've actually added another 11 dBs of total loss. And for example, if we now double it again from 10 to 20 kilometers, then this time the free space path loss is 12 dBs, bigger than it was our five kilometer path. And our gas loss has now gone from five to 20 kilometers, so that's 15 extra dBs. So when we add the 15 and the 12, we end up with a, a, an extra loss in the system now of 27 dBs. And so you're beginning to see that it's the gas loss which dominates when we want to work longer and longer paths. And this gas loss uh, mounts up very rapidly because it's loss in dBs per kilometer. It, it's not a, a, an absolute loss like the free space path loss where you just go up 6 dBs every time you double. So if, if you went from say 50 kilometers to 100 kilometers, the free space path loss will only go up by 6 dBs, but the gas loss will go up by an enormous amount. And so it, it's, it's this additional loss which makes life very difficult for working DX. Well, is there anything we can do about that? Well, we can try, I think it's all, all we can say. Um, firstly, we can do things to the system itself. Obviously, we don't have much transmit power to play with. It's probably only the order of a couple of hundred microwatts, something like that. And so the only way we can get extra gain, of course, is to use a bigger dish. Um, now that brings its own um, drawbacks um, because um, we have to worry about uh, how we feed that dish. We have to worry about the feed match. We have to worry about actually focusing the feed up to the dish. And we've, we've seen already that, that dish focusing is, is very critical. And we have to worry about whether the dish is going to uh, blow around in the wind or even deform in the wind if your dish is very big. Um, we can increase um, our 
um, system gain effectively a bit by uh, suppressing the image frequency uh, component in the received signal. And uh, it would certainly help if we had highly stabilized transmitter and receiver. So we should use an external uh, 10 megahertz reference, preferably uh, oven uh, crystal oscillators or double oven crystal oscillators. And then that should enable us to work digital modes or, or things like QRSS, which obviously will, will help with the signal to noise uh, problem. Uh, the only other thing we can do is to minimize the propagation losses. So we should operate our system as far away from the oxygen resonance as possible. So at the top uh, end of the band, uh, ideally we should use uh, elevated operating sites as high as you can. Um, and it's noticeable that the, uh, some of the Americans, um, K6ML for example, and, and his colleagues have uh, set the, the sort of DX records that they have done on 123 gigs uh, by operating um, from quite high mountains because there the atmospheric pressure is much lower. So there's, there's less water and oxygen to cause absorption. And also um, they've operated when the temperatures are very low because again, um, cold air doesn't hold as much water vapor as hot air does. So um, unfortunately, this doesn't help us in the UK very much because we don't have any really, really high mountains, um, but we will do our best, I suppose. Um, the only other thing I would say in conclusion is that there's very little experimental data available for propagation at 120 gig 122 gigahertz on long paths. And it may well be that other losses would also come into the equation. Uh, losses due to scattering, for example, uh, scintillation effects, um, even uh, fog and things like that uh, may also um, add additional loss. And so uh, certainly working DX at, at uh, this sort of frequency is, is really quite a challenge. Well, that's, that's really um, all I wanted to say this evening uh, in the formal part of the talk. Um, Arduino sketches for the various projects, the, the weather box and the uh, status display for the VK3 board are available. If you send me an email, then uh, I'll happily send you a, a copy of these. Right, so that's it. Now, how do I get out? Right, I'll press that. <laughs> right, back to you, Neil. Right, th thank you very much, um, Barry. Um, Hope you can hear me okay. Um, yes. Good. Um, that was an extremely interesting uh, talk, Barry. And um, one thing I've learned is uh, I've got one of the um, uh, BSB uh, dishes uh, like you use. And yes. I have been struggling to uh, set it up properly. And um, now I know how to do it. So thank you for that. Um, I've got one question to uh, kick off. And then um, uh, hopefully we shall have some more questions from our audience. Yeah. Um, if they'd like to um, uh, uh, type in on the um, the chat box on the uh, on the streamer, uh, John will be monitoring that and um, we'll be able to uh, uh, relay the questions to you, Barry. But I've got one question, and that's um, reference propagation. And the uh, have you done any work uh, to verify the results that you that, or to pre the predicted uh, path losses that you get with the um, uh, the weather box uh, with actual uh, real data in the field? Uh, I've done a little bit, not very much. Um, I think John ACE has probably done more than I have. Um, my experience so far is that over short paths, it seems to stack up reasonably well. Now, having said that, um, of course, there are uncertainties in the equipment itself um, in terms of what actually is your antenna gain, for example? What actually is your transmit power? And these are unknowns, really. I think we can only make guesstimates of, 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 you know, about those numbers. But um, from the paths I've done, um, and I've only worked up to 10K so far, um, the numbers stack up reasonably well. Um, 
I, I think that John's comment was that he thought over longer paths that the numbers were somewhat optimistic. And I think the reason for that is, well, again, it must be partly due to uncertainties in things like knowing the dish gains. Um, I, I don't know if anybody's used a weather box at each end of the paths yet um, and compared the measurements that they get on those two boxes. Um, but um, I would say that there probably are other propagation effects going on which aren't taken account of in the ITU model. Um, and, and I referred to things like um, scattering, um, things like that. I mean, certainly on the, on the 10K path that I did um, a few months, well, a couple of months ago now, I suppose, um, the, it, the weather wasn't particularly good that day. Um, although I could see the other end of the path, um, and we actually did use our, our um, LED, red LED light boxes to, to uh, align the systems at each end, which I haven't obviously mentioned in this talk. Um, but we could see, um, I suppose, clouds of very light, sort of misty rain stuff drifting across the path occasionally. And these certainly did have quite a noticeable effect on the received signals. So um, obviously the weather box wasn't, you know, taking that into account. And so um, I, I think one has to, over, over time, as, as we get more data uh, to, you know, comparisons between what weather box says and what people actually measure, then we might be able to build some fudge factors into the uh, into the equations, mm. but I think that's that's the best I can say at the moment. It's not perfect, but it gives you an idea. Um, and certainly, um, the the number at the bottom of the screen, which shows you the water content of the atmosphere, uh, even if you only took that number itself, that would be quite a good indication of whether it's worth trying to pass on any given day. And in fact, Weatherbox started off by just doing that one calculation. And then it was um, John ACE who goaded me into uh, <laughs> eventually producing the full, uh, <laughs> the full thing that you see now. <laughs> so I, I have John to thank for that. <laughs> but I have to say he was very good on, on beta testing of it, uh, as well as suggesting uh, more and more uh, things that one could actually put in it. Okay, thank, thank you very much. That's a very comprehensive uh, answer, uh, Barry. Uh, John, uh, GA, uh, sorry, uh, John, GCXTY, how you've unmuted. Um, do we have any questions uh, from the audience? I uh, haven't seen any questions yet. Uh, lots of things saying, thanks, Barry, excellent presentation. So, uh, well done. But uh, I'm still watching the uh, uh, screen on the uh, streamer to see if anybody comes up with a question. So I'll relay that if I see any. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. In that case, I've got um, another one for you, um, Barry. Yeah. Okay. Um, what um, I mean, with uh, digital modes, give quite an enhancement uh, for weak signal operating um, on the VHF, uh, UHF bands, and, and also HF, of course. Um, how much gain uh, do you expect to see on a particular path by using digital modes? Um, uh, it, it, because the the way of generating the digital signal is slightly different than um, we do it on the, the lower frequencies. Uh, as the politicians would say, I'm glad you asked me that question. <laughs> uh, I'll give you an answer, but it's not an exact answer. <laughs> um, yes, I, I agree that um, there will be penalties in, in generating the JT modes uh, in the way that it's being proposed here. Because obviously, um, if you look at the spectrum of the FM signal, which essentially is what we're using, um, then obviously there will be um, you know, there will be a lot of power which is wasted in the other sidebands in the spectrum. And also because the JT modes only use the uh, first upper sideband, because that's the way it's normally done uh, with an AM system, it's, it's just single sideband, 
Um, whereas here, we, we have no way of suppressing sidebands, um, which we're not actually using. So it's inevitable that we are going to lose quite a lot of power that way. And the question then is whether, um, you know, the losses because of that are outweighed by the gains from using, um, you know, the digital modes and the way that the decoding works. And, and, and I don't know the answer to that, mm -hmm. I'm afraid. Um, I think a better person to answer that question probably would be uh, Mike Clavel, K6ML, because um, he was the person who originated this idea of, of um, using the VK3 board. Well, actually, it, it, I think he was using his own version of the VK3 board to actually do this. Um, so he might actually do it in a very slightly different way to the way that I've, I've shown here. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, no, no one in this country so far has tried using digital modes. Um, and so uh, and, until somebody does that and, and does some systematic tests, then I don't think we'll be able to answer your question. You know, we, we're sort of, you know, very blue skies here, I think, uh, in, in this application. I, I mean, uh, the reason for mentioning these things in the talk really was to try and stimulate some activity and say, well, you can actually use these, these uh, transceiver boards for other things than what they were intended for. I mean, I mean, Andrew himself admits that he, he didn't anticipate that they could be used for things like this. So it, it's an interesting, you know, point that people have been thinking outside the box as to how to use them. I have got some more questions now. Yeah, okay. Go ahead, then, John. From Ben G for BXD, uh, his question is: As the boards arrive, is CW the easiest option? Um, I would say FM is the easiest option, really, um, because it's 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 inherent in the system. Uh, all you've got to do is is basically to follow the instructions which are on the. Uh, groups IO 122 um, web pages, the wiki uh, pages. It tells you how to set up to use FM. And um, you can work FM duplex very easily. All you've got to do is plug a microphone into the, uh, into the uh, mic socket and set the appropriate switches. So we're back to status displays again. <laughs> uh, but if you follow the instructions in the, in the wiki, um, it, it does. It does explain how to set the system up to work FM duplex or FM simplex. Um, if you just want to try the system out, then um, by all means um, set it into a CW beacon mode, which you do by just pressing two of the toggle switches down, uh, which is PTT and G. I'm just looking at my rig at the moment, and. Um, and that will put you automatically into beacon mode where it sends uh, a continuous tone at the appropriate frequency and, and then it gives you your call sign um, assuming you've programmed that in. Um, well if it doesn't it, it will give you VK3CB's call sign I think um, but that, that will certainly uh, tell you that the system is working. So but, but FM I think is probably the easiest um, what you do have to watch, though, is the deviation that you get. So um, it's probably better if you use an SDR uh, as your IF receiver rather than, say, um, an FT290 or um, an 817, um, because you, you do have to watch the modulation bandwidth. Um, it's very easy to overmodulate, that's what I'm saying. Um, but but it, it is easy to use FM. Um, for your first, your first contact or two. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay, okay. Do we have anything uh, else, uh, uh, John? Mike, GD6ICR says, my question would be, being in the Irish Sea and usual <laughs> sea paths, I wonder if we could reach another station off the island to GIGMLG. Ah, I should say probably not, but having said that, who knows? The answer is to try it, but it would depend critically 
on the path length for the reasons which I've explained already. I mean, you're, you're talking now about an overseas path. And uh, I guess certainly if you're fairly close to the sea level, uh, it's going to be inevitable that the water content is going to be very high and um, your uh, gas loss, the oxygen and water vapor loss is going to be high. And, and that certainly will not help you to, uh, to work that sort of path, I don't think. Uh, nobody's tried these paths yet, um, but don't underestimate the difficulty of working even a few kilometers uh, using this equipment. Um, I, I, would, I would suggest that you start over uh, paths of a few, hundred, uh, a few hundred meters to start with and familiarize yourself with the system and then gradually increase your path length. So maybe a, a kilometer, then two kilometers, three, four, five. Don't think just because you get a very good signal um, on a short path that you can automatically jump to a very long path. You could do that if you were using 10 gigahertz because you only have the free, the free space path loss to worry about where the path loss doubles, for every, sorry, increases by six dBs for every time you double the path length. Here, it doesn't work that way. Your, your path loss goes up very dramatically for even quite short increases in path length. So don't think instantly that you can work a long path, even on land between two hilltops. Um, it just doesn't work that way, unfortunately. So be cautious. Yeah, I, I think I can sort of echo that, uh, Barry, because the um, I think I may be wrong, but the uh, um, uh, distance uh, record in the UK at the moment from um, using the uh, the VK boards um, is about twelve kilometres. I'm not I'm not absolutely sure, but yeah. I know that yeah. when um, when they try when they did a contact over about nine kilometres, they had a lot of signal margin uh, in hand, but um, yes. When they got to 12 kilometers, um, they only just heard each other. So uh, yes, it, it just uh, reinforces the points you were making. Yeah. Well, on, on the 10 kilometer path I did, um, I also had lots of signal in hand or appeared to have lots of signal in hand as measured on an SDR. We then thought, well, we'll try 20 kilometers. Um, it was the path we'd done before on various other bands. Um, and we could see the other station, uh, well, we could see his um, uh, high-powered LED, which we used for alignment at each end. We could easily see that, um, but we didn't get any signal at all on 122. Um, so we'd, we'd lost all that um, apparent, uh, you know, margin that we had. Um, but uh, again, the weather wasn't ideal. Um, on that occasion. Um, we thought it was ideal because the visibility was very good, but um, th there was obviously extra effects going on in the atmosphere that uh, we either couldn't see or, or we, we couldn't account for. Uh, e even at 10 kilometers, um, I've noticed that, um, you know, one minute you can have quite a strong signal and then the next minute the signal has gone right down or disappeared and then it pops up again. So it, it does seem very variable as, as to what happens. And those must all be, you know, due to uh, atmospheric effects. So very challenging. Yeah. But that's, um, half, that's half the fun of it, isn't it, really? Yeah. And I just noticed a comment from uh, Neil G for DBN about yeah. that there already has been a contact between GD and GM on 122 gigahertz. Oh, right. But, okay. Yeah. But that was, of course, using much higher pa uh, transmit powers than oh, uh, oh, available yeah. on <laughs> the VK3 yes, yes. TV system. So, uh, <laughs> that's, che that's cheating, then. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I'm, I, I myself have actually uh, received um, higher power 122 yes. gigahertz yeah. on the uh, using uh, my uh, uh, VK3 CV board over about a 28 kilometer path but yes. um, obviously yes. they can't hear me the other way, going the other no, way because because no. of the power difference i think the receivers are quite good i mean when you compare compare the performance of this receiver against 
you know, a harmonic mixer, which would have been how people did it before, um, you know, you, you've probably gained quite a few dBs in terms of noise figure uh, using this system. And, uh, you know, once, once uh, one or two people start um, suppressing the unwanted sideband in the receiver, uh, that will also make the receiver even more, you know, potent, I think. OK, thank you, Barry. Is there anything else, um, John? Uh, yes, uh, one from, uh, oh, two questions from SQ6QV. Uh, one of them is, uh, have you done anything about phase noise measurements on the CW signal? And the second, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and the second one was, uh, there are two different antennas on the, the uh, chip. How does that spatial uh, offset affect propagation into the waveguide? Um, <laughs> another interesting question. <laughs> um, no, I certainly haven't done any phase noise measurements. Um, I'm not equipped to do that. Um, the business about the two antennas, um, this particular chip has two half wave dipoles for transmit and receive. And because the system is switched on all the time, it's radiating RF. Uh, this means that inevitably there will be some coupling between those two antennas. And that possibly is going to degrade the receiver somewhat. I don't know. Um, but the, the more important problem is actually coupling the signal from those two halfway dipoles um, into a proper dish feed or proper horn. And as I mentioned before, this, this, is, the, um, this is the job of the, the so-called transducer, which looks a bit like a, a little tiny egg cup is the best way to describe it, which actually sits over the, the uh, transceiver chip itself. It totally encloses it. And then um, the signal is allowed to come out somehow through a, a little hole in, in the thimble or the egg cup at the far end. Um, I think it's very difficult to say that that system is optimum in any sense. Um, I know Andrew uh, VK3CV um, said that he'd, he'd done a lot of modeling to try and optimize the design of that transducer. Um, but I, I think uh, Roger um, GHCUB uh, tried to do some measurements of output power from the system. And he came to the conclusion that that transducer may have a loss as much of six to 10 dBs. And that was the reason why I said earlier in the talk that although the nominal output power of the uh, radar chip itself, the 122 gig chip, um, is nominally half a milliwatt, um, I think actually they don't really know, the manufacturers themselves don't really know what it actually is because of the difficulty of actually coupling a power head um, into, that, into that chip in a meaningful way. So uh, what I've, I've tended to do in trying to do my system calculations um, is to assume that the, the power coming out from that transducer uh, is not half a milliwatt, but it's about 100 microwatts. In other words, I've assumed a 10 dB loss. And the same would be true, I suppose, on receive as well, coming the other way. Now, at the moment, that, if, if that is true, I, I must confess at the moment that I haven't included that 10 dB loss on receive. And so um, I think John um, ACE said that the weather box, for example, he thought gave very optimistic answers. And this might be one of the reasons why um, it, it may be one should subtract sort of six to 10 dBs from the estimated uh, carrier to noise that Weatherbox produces. Uh, and you might be somewhat closer to, the, to reality. So that, that is obviously something which needs to be looked at. But um, I think some more meaningful measurements need to be done on what the actual output power of the transceiver board is when that transducer is in place. And I think only uh, people like Roger, G GHCUB, can actually do meaningful measurements. He has the gear probably to do that, but uh, certainly I, I wouldn't have that, and I don't know anyone else who does. Uh, certainly that transducer is not optimum, and, and it's very hard to see how it could be made optimum. So to some extent, you have to live with that. 
and certainly when I do um, my um, calculations using Weatherbox, when I do my predictions, I, I, I take a nominal output power for the board of um, 100 microwatts rather than the uh, 500 microwatts, which is the sort of nominal spec. So I'm, I'm uh, you know, compensating to some extent for that. But that's that's the best I can say at the moment. I think I think it's a work in progress, and more work needs to be done. Uh, the other thing I'd say about Witherbox is that um, to make the predictions of received signal level uh, more accurate, uh, one needs a lot of data um, from various people um, where they've got weather boxes at both ends of a link. They both measure um, the, the weather data and they record it on on the SD card. And um, they also um, record the, the received signal to noise ratios. And uh, we, we try and correlate that, um, you know, with, with what's, what's going on, basically. Because until, until we, um, you know, we can correlate real measured data with what Weatherbox predicts, then we, we can't come up with a system which, you know, gives a, a much more realistic answer. Um, so at the moment, that, that, that's the best I can say, I think. Okay, thank you, Barry. Um, uh, anything, I haven't seen anything else on the um, streamer, John. Um, John? <laughs> a, question, a question from G6UAJ. Do you have any links to further weather box information? Um, yes, um, it was um, published um in scatter point um but if he wants to get in touch with me then um i can supply him with more information so if he gets in touch with me uh, by email uh and if he if he intends to build one um i can also let him have a copy of the arduino software um that that's no problem at all in fact, quite a few people have actually built these and um, and have received copies of the software. Um, a question now from Peter LB0K: What sort of range can one expect with two units and the simple antenna? In other words, just the transducer for, on the chip itself. He was thinking of using it as a, in exhibitions, for example, demonstrate. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. Um, so is, is that including the little 20 dB horns? I would say either with the horns or without the horns, just di direct. Well, certainly with the horns, I, th I think you would work um, certainly a few hundred meters. Um, certainly done that um, without, without much problem. So for demonstration purposes, I mean, you if you're demonstrating just across a room or something like that, uh, I, I don't think that you would need almost any any um, antenna at all. Um, but certainly the the you, you could use the, the chaparral feed, I think, uh, but probably the horns are better. Um, you, you would get a, a very strong signal, you know, certainly within a room, something like that. No problem at all. Right, okay. And yeah, then... I'm yeah, I was just going to say, I've done um, probably about um, 60, 70 metres across the uh, the garden, just from chip to chip. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, certainly, I think the first test I did was with, with the horns and um, 600 metres was easy to do. That that wasn't a problem. Um, so I, I think with the horns, you know, he, he would be able to do demonstrations, quite convincing demonstrations um over over regional distances okay thank you uh, next question was from john g8 bxh uh, thank you board on the way has laura modulation been tried uh, not that i'm aware of okay thank you i think uh, that's all the questions i've seen so far i, I think i would i would add a comment to that in that is that if someone wants to try it, then by all means try it and see what happens. Um, the list of, of um, you know, modulations and modes that, that I listed earlier were only ones that I myself have tried. Um, 
I have I have a visions of possibly TV, but um, I think it'll have to be narrowband TV, um, not not uh, sort of wideband, because um, of the inherent um, problems with the phase lock loop chip, which is on the on the VK3 board. Um, I, I, I think it's um, uh, it, it's something to do with the the way the chip works. Um, I, th I think there are better phase up loop chips around now, which uh, might enable you to work, uh, you know, sort of reasonable video signals. But I think at the moment, um, uh, slow scan obviously um, is is possible. Um, and uh, well, obviously we've shown that, but uh, and also um, I think narrow bands, um, you know, 10 kilohertz bandwidth, 20 kilohertz bandwidth, that sort of thing, ought to go. I have tried um, narrowband TV, um, but um, the speech amplifier on the VK3 board um, hasn't got a, a low frequency response, which goes down low enough because for narrowband TV, you, you need to have a, a signal which almost goes down to DC. Um, and of course, the, the present uh, video board only goes down to about 300 hertz, I think. Um, the only other way of, of, of doing it would be to modulate the phase up loop chip directly. Um, so that, that is a possibility, um, which I haven't got around to trying yet. But I think fast scan TV, I, I think it's not possible with this system. Um, but it, it might be if one had a board using the other um, 122 gig radar chips, which are available. There are some other ones available which um, actually have better antennas on board. They have um, um, arrays of patch antennas for, for both transmit and receive. And um, there are alternative board designs to, to the one we've just discussed this evening, um, which um, have been described. There was one in Dubus a few months ago, um, uh, but there is another one as well. And, and it might be that those use a different sort of phase up loop chip which can be modulated at higher frequencies and so uh, might be suitable for for tv purposes but i don't think anyone's demonstrated that yet one comment from uh, roger gacub thanks barry excellent talk best coupling loss i measured was minus five db okay oh good thank you so uh, maybe the output power is slightly higher than I was thinking then, in that case. But he did say best, he didn't say uh, <laughs> what he'd done to achieve that. Um, <laughs> it, I mean, it boils down also, I suppose, also to, you know, how well your dish is matched up to the feed and all sorts of things, doesn't it, really? But certainly I found the dish focusing was, was quite critical. Um, it was very easy to lose 10 dBs of received signal if, uh, you know, if, if your dish wasn't focused up very well. Okay, it's that, uh, I assume that's it then, John, for, uh, for questions. Uh, yes, nothing yeah. else at the moment. Okay, just, well, as a, just as a comment, how many people actually listened in on that? Uh, the maximum number I saw is 92, and currently okay, it's 64. Good. Yeah, okay, that's good, that's good. Yeah, and last time uh, we, uh, we had, um, uh, the last talk also had uh, over 300 views on YouTube, so... Um, oh, right, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and we've got, uh, we've got an international audience as far as, v uh, including VK this evening. Oh, right, oh, that's good, that's good. Yeah. Okay, well, um, we'll wrap it up now. Thank you very much, uh, Barry. That was uh, re really very excellent. Welcome. And uh, it spurred me on to, uh, uh, once we're allowed out lock, uh, lockdown and uh, um, <laughs> get out yes. when it was a bit colder to try and increase um, distances, but that might not be possible this year. Um, but well, if you, thinking... if you want something else to do to pass the time, um, did you see that video which came out last week about, um, 30 terahertz uh, no a, no i didn't see that one. Oh, this i thought that that we thought that was on the um, uk microwaves um a posting on the uk microwaves group 
but it may um, well have been perhaps I, I haven't looked <laughs> oh well have a look because um uh, bk3cv has actually now uh, produced the system to work at 30 terahertz uh, which oh. is uh, a yeah, wavelength of, of, sorry i have seen it <laughs> yeah okay yeah that's the one well, yeah yeah well I, i've built a system up since that video was shown mm -hmm. and uh, had it working outside <laughs> <laughs> right. so that that would be quite an interesting project if you get bored <laughs> yeah i've got i've got plenty to do i'm, I'm sure you have <laughs> yeah okay well uh we'll wrap things up now thank you very much uh, barry you're very welcome uh, that, that was really really good um and uh, judging by the number of people that were were um watching a, a, a good audience so um just to uh, tell you next month we've got um kent wa5 bjb will be giving us um, a talk on antennas. So we're move, I, I, and it'll be sort of conven conventional antennas. So we'll be moving away from um, uh, high gigahertz um, frequencies down towards the, the lower microwave uh, bands. So um, that would be on uh, Wednesday, the 10th of February, again at 22, uh, uh, sorry, 2000 UTC. So I'd just like to uh, thank you all for, for watching and um, I look forward to uh, seeing you in uh, four weeks' time. Thank you very much.